So, uh, first of all, welcome to the session, Bad Boys of the EU, demonizing Poland and Hungary. So we have Hungary present and we have Poland present uh, so that they can uh, respond uh, to the accusations. Uh, my name is Tony Gilland. Uh, I'm Chief of Staff at MCC Brussels, uh, and I'm also an Associate Fellow of the Academy of Ideas. Uh, MCC Brussels, you may not have heard of before. Uh, you may have seen a couple of other speakers referring to it. It's a new think tank, just had its first year in Brussels, and in many ways it's designed to do some of the sorts of wonderful work that the, uh, the Academy of Ideas have done with the Battle of Ideas, which is open up space for debate. Create a space in Brussels and around where people can argue over the important issues uh, uh, with no holds barred. And free speech, respect, but argue it out. So that's what we're doing in Brussels. When I was invited to do that, a very good journalist friend of mine said, hmm, MCC, that's Matthias Corvinius Collegium, and it's a very large Hungarian educational organization. He said, hmm, you might want to check out this book uh, I'll lend you on Viktor Orban. And I read this book, and it was about uh, the, the lack of independence of the judiciary, it was about uh, uh, the, the lack of plurality of the media, and it was basically non-stop attack on Hungary. And I thought, well, this is so one-sided, I think I'll find out for myself. I'll take the job, thank you very much, <laughs> and go and work it out for myself. But once I got to Hungary, in amongst talking to, going to all these networking events to do my job and meeting all these people from Brussels, I'm always a very direct and honest sort of person, so I always explain where I'm coming from and that I'm working with this larger organization from Hungary. And it took about five minutes to get to this conversation where they were attacking me, how could you possibly work <laughs> for this organization? Don't you know this? Don't you know that? And so I guess my point is, it became very, very clear to me that Hungary was being demonized. And equally, as I worked further, clear that Poland was also uh, under attack. Now, I'm not telling you what I think about that. I'm just saying it was very, very clear that that was what was happening. So this debate is about trying to understand that, and obviously uh, everyone had their different perspectives, but try and understand why in particular Poland and Hungary were seen in such a bad light by all these other uh, people from different uh, European member states. So that's our purpose, okay? Uh, so first to speak will be uh, Balash Edvegi. Uh, very pleased to have Balash here. He's an MEP. Uh, and has been since 2019. He's a member of the Civil Liberties, uh, Justice and Home Affairs uh, Committee, as well as the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, and previously you were a member of the Hungarian Parliament and a former director of communications for Desh, for Fidesz, which is the uh, ruling government party. So thank you for being with us. Second to speak will be Stephen Barrett, who you may have seen earlier in the uh, very controversial, <laughs> very lively, very to the point, uh, debate on Euro European Court of Human Rights. Uh, Stephen is a commercial barrister. Uh, he's with Radcliffe Chambers, but he's a passionate scholar of law. And he has a very strong interest in the separation between politics and law. And wrote a really interesting article earlier this year on the EU's uh, rule of law crisis. Now, this is a big thing in the EU. It's about uh, the things I mentioned before, judiciary, media, etc., all the things that are required to make a democracy work. Uh, the EU has taken a big perspective on this, uh, and Stephen, we're going to hear your perspective on it. Uh, then we have uh, Agnieszka Kolek, who is my colleague uh, from MCC Brussels. She's uh, our head of cultural engagement. Uh, she's also an artist, a curator, and founder of uh, Passion for Freedom, London Art Festival, uh, and just until very recently was the deputy director of the Castle Centre for Contemporary Art in Warsaw. So Agnieszka will be speaking uh, to the culture uh, and politics of Poland, okay? And then finally, we have Anna Lufti, who is an uh, equality and human rights barrister, consultant to the Bad Law Project, um, which coordinates legal action in the public interest. And she also taught at the Central Eastern European uh, University in Budapest. So she has some uh, experience and knowledge of Hungary as well. Okay, 
please welcome our panel. So they have just five minutes maximum each uh, before we have a conversation. Balash, please. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, and good afternoon to uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me say that I have found this uh, uh, program, Battle of Ideas, fantastic. I've been to various um, uh, panels, and uh, I, uh, I really like the live discussions and all the opinions expressed. Now, bad boys of the EU are quite a telling uh, a title indeed, so I feel like a bad boy sitting here uh, representing my uh, country. Um, let me just share a few thoughts with you uh, about the subject and why I think Hungary has, has received so much attention and receives, continues to receive so much attention uh, in European politics, in the public discourse, and even beyond Europe. Um, we talk about a rule of law uh, debate with uh, uh, Brussels. That's what you hear about and read about in the press. Fundamentally, the debate uh, is about really the vision of Europe, what kind of European cooperation we believe in and what kind of Europe or European Union the current Brussels bureaucracy mainstream is trying to build. And there is a, a clear conflict there, uh, a contrast and a difference of, of, of vision. Um, and that is what uh, is at the core of all the debates and all the, 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 co the consequences of it politically. Uh, the question really is about where decisions are made. Uh, Hungary and the, the Fidesz government is a strong believer in European cooperation between member, uh, nation states, sovereign nation states. We believe in the EU where nation states are respected and also decision making is done according to the treaties. We don't think uh, that it's a good idea for uh, Brussels bureaucrats to suddenly uh, take away uh, an increasing number of, of areas and decisions um, and, and bureaucratically decide instead of member states, instead of national parliaments on key issues. Um, there are a number of those key issues. Let me just mention two that have caused um, uh, perhaps the, the, the largest or loudest debates over the past couple of years. One is migration. What do you do with migration? Uh, how do you differentiate between asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants, economic migrants, especially illegal migrants? What do you do about that and who decides about this issue, uh, that issue. I'm sure we're gonna talk more about that later on. We are very strongly uh, uh, in, in the opinion that it should be up to each member state to decide who they let in their country and under what conditions, and that the law must be respected, and we have done a lot to do that. And that's, uh, that's in contrast with, with fair policies in Brussels um, uh, very often. The other one is gender. Um, and it's important to say it r right. It's, it's gender, is the gender propaganda. Um, I have heard very, very interesting debates previously uh, today and yesterday here during the debates about that and the difference between LGB advocacy versus the transsexual uh, 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 onslaught uh, and what this has caused and is causing as harm to um, uh, to equality. So that's the other issue. We have passed a law to protect children and to protect parents' rights uh, about the sexual education of their children, and that has caused uh, the second great uproar in, in Brussels, and there are procedures against it, etc., etc. Uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that um, in more detail. Really, it comes down to the, the point of whether or not the EU respects its own rule of law, its own treaties. Uh, in our opinion, very often it does not. Um, uh, the Commission uh, and the European Court of Justice, interestingly, um, regularly over overstep their, their competences um, in an undemocratic way, uh, and that is actually uh, weakening the whole of the EU and it's making uh, European cooperation more difficult. Um, so just uh, perhaps shortly, this is what uh, I wanted to say in the beginning, and I'd be very, very glad to get into more detail and ask, uh, or, or answer, rather, your questions or, or opinions and listen to my fellow panelists. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, Bella. <laughs> okay, thanks for leaving plenty of time for discussion. Stephen. So, the EU rule of law crisis is, has fascinated me for years. It's uh, encapsulated in the first article I ever wrote for The Spectator. And the best introduction I still think on the, on the subject is my article in The Critic on it. 
very few people actually admit it's happening. <laughs> so for the first, the first is I, I, I have to admit that it's going off. And, and so let's, I'll, I'll just explain the rule of law. There, there are lots of, of, of uh, quasi-politicians um, posing as lawyers who will, tell, who will give you some really long explanation of what the rule of law is, by the way, including the EU. The rule of law just means that the law applies to everybody. Okay, that, that's really all it means, and that the, the, everybody must follow the laws. So what's going on inside the EU? They signed the Lisbon Treaty. The member states of the Lisbon Treaty signed the Lisbon Treaty. That was a fundamental change from the Maastricht Treaty. In the Maastricht Treaty, the member states defined the areas of competence for the EU. Some things the EU could do, some things the EU couldn't do. The EU is in charge of this, with nation states are in charge of that, clearly defined. The Lisbon Treaty is not clearly defined. The EU Commission, provided it can convince the European Court of Justice, is in control of what it says is an EU power. So it's defining its own rules. EU law is supreme. Every member state accepts EU supremacy. We had it in the case law. It was going to be in the body of the Lisbon Treaty. Then there was a bit of an argy-bargy about that. But it's still in the, uh, I think it's Declaration 17 at the back of the treaty. It's still there. Everybody knows EU law is supreme. So if you're an EU member state, you have to do what the EU says. And the EU can define how much power the EU has provided it can convince the ECJ. So, so the, the actors involved in all of this, there's way more than Poland and Hungary. I mean, I, I would flag that I do think that Poland and Hungary get disproportionately treated in relation to this, and I'll, I'll, I'll highlight that in a very simple way. The first real actor in the EU rule of law crisis was Germany, okay? During COVID, the EU decided it now had the power to uh, get some loans and to borrow some money. It, did, it hadn't previously had that power, but it decided it did. It skipped off to the European Court of Justice and said, we do have this power, don't we? And it's totally independent court decided that it did have that power. And Karlsruhe, which is the main court in Germany, went, no, 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 that was the first time somebody had defied the supremacy of EU law and told the EU no. That was not so Poland, by the way, is involved in all of this. Poland's being fined a million euros a day. Germany got a mild slap on the wrist, told not to do it again. The court didn't promise to not do it again, so it, Karlsruhe could still do it again. But the German government privately wrote, and we know because this came out in a Freedom of Information request, but the, the German government privately wrote to the commission and said, oh, I, our court won't do it again. No, they'll be good. They'll be good. We promise. And so Germany started it. Germany's not solved it. Germany got barely punished at all. The commission did said it was starting to take action, but nothing happened against Germany. After Germany, many nation states have now followed. Ireland has threatened to do it. Romania has done it. Remember, the, the it is defying the supremacy of EU law. And they almost, all, all the people who do it just say, our constitution trumps the treaty because of how they're structured. In, 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 if we were doing it in the UK, we'd do it in a totally different way, but I won't bore you with how. But, but because of their constitutions are, are, are all post-war, or most of them post-war, or post-USSR, um, they're often very similar, so they do things in very similar ways. The actors who are doing this say this breaches our constitution. Poland's done it, Hungary's done it, Germany started it, Spain's done it, France threatened to do it, Sweden and the Baltic states did it, um, and Ireland has threatened to do it. The Irish Supreme Court has postulated that it is possible that the Irish Constitution, this all gets into the realm of magic, this is not real law, but it, it's postulated that, that, that the Irish Constitution might trump the EU in certain circumstances, i.e. when the EU says that it has the power to do something that Ireland doesn't like. And that is what's going on. It, it is a massive tension. There is disproportionate uh, punishment of Poland and Hungary. And the other thing that, just to finally point out, is the reason I could do air quotes about the European Court of Justice and still sleep at night and not feel guilty as a lawyer is that that court is not a respectable body. And we discovered that after Brexit when it immediately expelled our judges, yeah. the UK judges. And the way that it behaved in expelling those judges was unbelievable. So they, they, they had a hearing at which the judge, the, 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 the judge who was expelled was there. And they said, oh, you've got to go. And then she appealed it. 
And they didn't tell her when the appeal was happening. They didn't let her lawyer go to the appeal. They just said, oh, we've had the appeal and you lost. Uh, that was totally reprehensible. And, and there are other things I'll say about that court, but it's not a respectable body. And that makes the crisis worse, because how do you fix a rule of law crisis if your courts aren't trustworthy? Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Agnieszka, please. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah excellent. Um, so I will not. Um, I will address this issue from a different angle. Um, I'm an artist and a curator. When I lived in London for 20 years, I co-founded art festival called Passion for Freedom. And over the years, what we came across many times was that the core of the festival has been Central Eastern European. And there were always people really curious, why is it that people from Eastern and Central Europe are so um, immune um, and aware of the first smell of losing the freedom, the first moment where you start losing it and how it feels and how it smells and what you hear, what kind of phrases. In relation to the rule of law and um, all the list that uh, my predecessor, uh, the first speaker was listing, we have to go back to the values. And we were talking quite a lot about values here at the festival and what's going on with them in the West, uh, in, in Britain, Germany, and France. So Poland is still uh, serious about the values. The values are Christian. And whether you believe or not, the Christian values are underpinning everything. And uh, before Poland entered EU, there was a big discussion um, about that, that the European constitution is not openly adhering to the Christian values and creates this kind of like a superficial European common values that on the surface it all sounds great, but actually if you go deep down, um, it doesn't really um, respect them, it doesn't really follow through with them. And um, the other part, going back also to art and culture, is the freedom of expression. Uh, there is a joke, and I think it's similar between Polish and Jews, that when you have two Poles or two Jews, there's three opinions. So we like, <laughs> you, we like to argue, we like to um, always go, go against each other and so on. So in Poland, it would be unthinkable to stop comments under the articles in the newspapers like it's common in Britain. Um, the first newspaper that started to exercise it is Wyborcza, which is similar to the British Guardian, uh, because they just didn't like the comments. Uh, and um, what was interesting that in 2015 in London, we couldn't show the work of Mimsy because the police contacted the mall gallery saying that the artwork is potentially inflammatory and they would advise us not to show this artwork here in London. And as Central Eastern Europeans, we, decide, um, we decided that we're going to show the work. And they said we would have to pay for the police protection, 6,500 pounds a day. So being Poles, Hungarians, Czechs, and Slovaks, we said we're going to find the money. So they continued to blackmail us into not showing this work, saying that they're going to shut down the exhibition. Now, in contrast, uh, we had an exhibition together with Wiazdowski Castle, with the appointed director Piotr Bernatowicz in 2021-22, for five months we were showing the works of Lars Wilks, among them the roundabout dog, and the world didn't end. And of course for the technocrats from the Western Europe, they're going to show that they have naked bums. Because of the unrestricted migration, their citizens are not safe. I survived the terror attack in 2015 in Copenhagen where we were just discussing the freedom of expression. And people ask, why don't you invite the opposition to say, or why you shouldn't draw Mohammed or talk about it? You don't invite them, they come uninvited, and they shoot at you. Uh, and um, when I was discussing the subject with Tony, he also wanted me to address an issue of the abortion law in Poland. And here, again, we would have to go back to the history and also to the Christian values. So if it's underpinning value, then you value the human life and you try to support it. And there was a lot of misinformation about the change in the abortion law. Um, and um, you know, if you, if you want to ask more questions later, I can go into the depth. But what was changed is that the, the uh, Constitutional uh, Tribunal removed the um, permission for abortion when there is a suspicion that the child might be disabled. 
And this is in contrast to Britain, where you can uh, abort a child with Down syndrome up to 24th week of pregnancy. And there was recently a court case by Heidi Crowther, uh, and she took British government to court saying that this is a discrimination and this is a genocide of uh, people with Down syndrome. So I think we would have to go again back to the values because it's a bit like a big iceberg and what you see at the top and what's being discussed by the technocrats, they use different uh, excuses for playing their own games. But for people, these values are really deep rooted and they have a meaning mm -hmm. and that's why it influences the discourse. Thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka. <laughs> okay, that's really fascinating to hear more about Polish culture and values. Anna, you're now in the position of reflecting on uh, these speakers, but also obviously your own uh, thoughts. Well, again, I'll take my own angle and uh, we'll open it up because I don't know how it's going to go down. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a thought in progress. In September 2022, uh, lawmakers in Brussels declared that Hungary was no longer a democracy. And we all know, and that's why we hear, that Hungarian and Polish governments have been repeatedly condemned for various Euro crimes relating to uh, censorship of academics and media censorship, LGBTQ rights and uh, the independence of the judiciary being undermined and so on. Um, and in, uh, again, September 2022, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen complained that both these governments were failing to amend their laws, quote, in the way we have agreed. The recent lessons from Hungary and Poland reveal actually a complete redefinition of what democracy means. Because according to Brussels, democracy means an obedient administration or an obedient bureaucratic uh, entity that unconditionally accepts supranational state authority. And yet what we've seen is the um, awkward government in Poland and Hungary uh, uh, stubbornly clinging to an old definition of democracy based on the nation state as self-governing, self-determining, independent of foreign control and supranational influence. And they had repeatedly rejected inf interference in their particularly cultural and political life on the old fashioned grounds that these are matters for the Polish and Hungarian people. So why, why are they so stubborn? Is it because they are out of touch, backward and unsophisticated? Or could it be perhaps something to do with the Prussian, Habsburg and Russian partitions of Poland from, the se from 1795 to 1918, the invasion of Poland by the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany in 1939, the occupation of Poland by the Nazis until 1945, Soviet control of Poland from 1952 to 1989, the reduction of Hungarian territories by 71% after World War I under the influence of the Axis powers, the Soviet grip on Hungary as a key satellite state until 1989, even after that country's failed grab for national independence in 1956. <coughs> What does democracy mean if it has been redefined as a willingness to unconditionally accept supranational control? That is the question that the Hungarian and Polish cases and their histories <coughs> force us to ask. What makes a democracy today different from a 20th century satellite or a 19th century imperial possession? That is the question that Hungarian and the Polish cases force us to ask. Now you might say, and Bolaj hinted at it, that what makes us democratic is the fact that we have organic European values which are enshrined in Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union as respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and respect for human rights, including minority rights. Well, Poland and Hungary have argued, and this is for us to heed and, and engage with, that these are buzzwords that are used by supranational authorities to impose policies which threaten the sovereignty of the nation state, immigration being one of them. And for their opposition to an open borders policy, both countries have been repeatedly and roundly criticized. So I'm going to close with a proposition that I believe can end the intractable problem of Brussels versus the bad boys of the EU, I say, let us not speak any longer of Europe, European va values, since people from outside Europe are settling in large numbers, and there should be nothing inherently European about 
European countries. So let us speak instead of world values. Let there be no nation states, only obedient regional administrations under supranational authority, and then we can abolish without any guilt the idea of Hungary, the idea of Poland, together with their pesky nationalist governments, and anyone who disagrees is, of course, anti-democratic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Anna, thank you very much for that dystopian uh, vision that you've painted for us and offered us. Um, okay, now, I just want to, before we go out to the audience, I know there's a huge audience, that's great, and we'll get loads of questions in, um, but I just wanted to push the panel on a couple of points before we went out to the audience, okay? Um, and first of all, I want to start with, and perhaps, Stephen, your comment on this first, is this question of Article 2 of the European Treaty that Anna's just mentioned, uh, it includes this idea of foundational values, which includes minority rights. And whilst you correctly mentioned, well, you know more than I do, so I don't want to say correctly, whilst you mentioned the Lisbon Treaty and how that changed things, it's my understanding that f through the Amsterdam Treaty, the accession countries, the new 10 countries that joined in 2004, of which Hungary was one, was signing up to these foundational values. And... So what I am constantly told when I am in Brussels, you knew what you were getting into, you knew that uh, minority rights had to be respected, you knew that LGBT was important, probably the Q was maybe around then, maybe, there's a, but anyways, what I'm constantly told is you knew what you were signing up for. Stephen, is that fair? So um, I think the most important point, just, uh, just to highlight, that part of the treaty is there because the EU and the ECHR are both confections of international law and they don't get on. The EU promised in its Lisbon Treaty that it would join the ECHR and it never has. Okay, And it, and it, it hates ECHR. But by putting in Article 2, it argued, oh, well, we've already got fundamental rights. We, we, we just define what the fundamental rights are. We don't need the help of the European Court. I mean, I don't think anybody needs the help of the European Court, but, but they, they signed up to that. So that's their treaty promise that they've broken. It's arguable that, that Poland and Hungary signed up and knew. The question is to the extent to which they knew and the extent to which these matters are defined now. I mean, LGBT is, is a perfect one because I had friends uh, waiting um, in our parliament should anybody have tried to litigate on LGBT+, plus, because you can't put a mathematical symbol into law because it's not defined. If law is not defined, it doesn't exist. It just doesn't, it's nothing, it's nonsense. You kill law with lack of definition. And I w if I were arguing for Poland and Hungary, I would say, well, look, you've, you've defined these things so poorly, they don't really exist. And a good example is the very definition of the rule of law. Because I told you it. It's very simple. It's just that the rules belong, uh, apply to everybody. No one is above the law. Be you ever so mighty, no one is above the law. That's it. No, if you ask the EU for a definition, you'll get pages of text, pages of words, meaningless words, words that contradict the other words. They have blown up the definition. So arguably, the rule of law is in crisis in the EU, notwithstanding all of the other stuff, but because they can't even define it. So they're killing it. Okay. All time. right. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> good. Very good. Right, so perhaps this will be a question for Agnieszka and Anna, uh, but first of all, I'm going to turn to Balash. But just so you're thinking about it, so Steve was just given this very clear legal explanation why it's all over the place. They don't know what they're talking about. They can't define anything, etc., etc. More broadly, the EU would say the accession countries wanted to be part of the European Union. They recognised that the European Union represented a different way of life. Uh, that it had some distinct values that would require a change within your culture. They would argue that that was the case, and that and that you and therefore, even if you didn't know the legal definitions of what you were getting into, because they're not very well defined, um, you did know that you were moving into a new situation, and that was something that you were embracing. And maybe you 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 now just got cold feet and trying to back out of it. Something's fast. Well, we certainly, certainly uh, didn't uh, sign up to anything like uh, uh, this forced migration agenda. That well, is do the LGBT one first. Hmm? Do the LGBT one first. No, no, no. But I'll, I'll, I'll get to you, that point. Right, you will I'll get, get to that point. Okay, we certainly <laughs> didn't sign up for that. 
uh, especially not because mass migration as it is happening uh, is really changing um, a country's identity, really. Cultural identity is, changes, is, is changing the, the you know, everyday life, is changing customs, is changing values. That's certainly not in any other treaties that we signed up to now. Coming to the LGB or LGBT issue, and it's, a, and it's, a, it's an important difference here. Um, our law to protect children and parents' rights uh, to educate their children is about that, and it's not about homosexuality. What it, what it rejects and uh, what it uh, provides a protection against is the aggressive gender identity as it, as it is happening here. We've heard, I just came from uh, the panel uh, that, uh, that Anne Furedia uh, uh, held uh, uh, the previous panel, uh, which was about that. And, and LGB activists are saying that this is crazy what's, what's happening and how this trans uh, movement and this attack on children in school, etc., and, and leaving parents out of it, how this is actually destroying equality of homosexuals that they had forced for, 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 for a long time. So we certainly didn't sign up for any of that either. And, and these decisions should be made at national level. It's a question of sovereignty. And let me just also just add one last thing. I never would have thought, uh, and certainly I, but I would never have, uh, would have thought 35 years ago, when we were looking towards the West as the symbol of freedom, the symbol of liberty, really, that 35 years later, I will be finding this kind of anti-liberty uh, attack coming from Brussels institutions. This is what's what's my everyday experiences at the European Parliament. These people who claim to be liberals and progressives, etc., they, in fact, have become the worst enemies of freedom. Freedom of thought, freedom of expression, etc., etc., freedom of lo lots, uh, 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 lots of things. Okay, thank you very much. Right, so I'm going to turn to Anna and then uh, Deska. And Anna, just th this question of whether uh, the Central Eastern European states had an idea of what they were signing up to. So whether it's not just LGBT, but uh, migration as well, the Western world was already very uh, big on open borders and letting lots of uh, uh, migrants into the, their countries. That was already the case. Do you think that either uh, the CE countries were being a bit naive? Uh, were they trying to have it both ways in joining this exclusive club that would give them access to a single market? access to resources that were designed to make them more like Western Europe, and then they just didn't like it when they discovered it? Or how did we get into this position? I mean, it's very difficult to give these uh, questions, you know, pat answers. But the, the things that Hungary is concerned about or Poland is concerned about, whilst there'll be specific issues that are particular to those countries, and as I hope I indicated, those countries' histories, uh, a lot of the issues that seem to be at, at, um, at stake have hit the Western world too. I mean, what Bolaj was saying is that he's been in panels where people have been talking about indoctrination of, of children in schools, for example, or the promotion of ideas of LGBT, when nobody knows what the bloody hell that means anyway. They're certainly not legal categories, but they are being pushed. Well, that has been a huge issue here. Many people in this country will argue that there are issues about how the judiciary make decisions and whether they are improperly influenced or not. So it's not clear to me, unless we rely on some niche study that's been commissioned by some unknown entity, which is, has taken responsibility for measuring the progress of different countries under the auspices of this supranational body. It's not clear to me what makes Hungary so unique when it comes to having questions about certain policies from countries like France or Germany or the Netherlands. There are huge concerns in those countries about uh, illegal immigration. And how are you supposed to sign up, even if you were told at the beginning that you're signing up to protect transsexual children, right? Uh, that is why you're joining this uh, this community to protect transsexual children, even if you accepted that there were transsexual children and that there's no issue at all with transsexual children and that Hungary is prepared to fight the transsexual child cause to the death, why then, why then should that country be forced to accept huge numbers of sometimes 
illegal uh, immigrants from places where it's not only transsexualism that is not recognized culturally, but homosexuality. I mean, you've really got to be able to ask the questions. And then the whole point about Brussels is that they never have to answer anything. It's always Hungary that has to answer. It's always Poland that has to answer. It's always Brexiteers that have to answer the questions. You're not allowed to ask, how do you square untrammeled, open borders, illegal immigrants coming from countries where homosexuality is culturally and legally prohibited with your LGBT rights plus policy? Answer me that. Riddle me that. Okay. You're never, and, and one final <laughs> thing. One final thing. One final thing. If we're going to ask questions, if we're going to ask questions of Brussels, it is this. How do you explain Ursula von der Leyen or any of the others? How do you explain that Orban, Viktor Orban, was an anti-communist agitator for years? How is it that this anti-communist, this person who fought the legacy of the Soviet <laughs> Union for all of his youthful adult life, how has he become the bad boy of the EU? You need to ask that question before you start telling everybody else how they should answer it. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> right, okay, so I'm, I'm, just to warn you, I'm about to come out to the audience after Agnieszka's had a chance to speak. Uh, so get your questions ready. Agnieszka, you can comment on what you'd like. Mm -hmm. You may, if you wish to uh, address that question about uh, communism and the uh, effects that that's had, because uh, I know that in private conversations with you over lunch, I found some of the, your comments there very interesting. Or you might like to address the recent Polish election result, just mm. to get that on the table. Choose one thing, and uh, then we'll go out to the audience. I think it was the interesting point that Anna made at the end about uh, being anti-communist and so on, because that also links to the judicial reform in Poland, because before the fall, fall of communists, they introduced certain changes into the judiciary, and then since then it was not reformed. And there were the times, there were the times uh, when uh, the current opposition was in power, and they were also talking about this reform, but it was never really done. and. Um, the judges that were elected, they were elected for like nine years, so there was a very long period that it seemed that the same people are in power, so the citizens were really getting uh, um, pissed off, to be honest, <laughs> because th when there were really big cases about the repression of people during communism, these people were not convicted, they were getting scot-free, whether it was in relation to very um, the, the, um, the court case on the killing of the nine coal miners in Katowice in my neighborhood when there was a strike, whether it was about the priest Popiewuszko, his murder. Um, these people could see that this needs reform. And, and in relation to these issues like, oh, we were joining the club, why we didn't see the small print and so on, I think I think all of that is excuses for them to put us in the line. If there was not the LGBTQ thing, there would be something else. They would always find something to put us in the line uh, because I think they are aware that our society still hold values. Because we were fighting communists, we still have that spirit in us. And even you know, in the Polish anthem, we say that Poland will exist uh, as long as we are alive, meaning like the last Pole is on the ground, we're going to fight. So obviously this is a threat for them. So they're trying to beat us with all these different laws and technicalities. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Right, so over to the audience. Obviously you've heard strong words from the panel. Feel free to disagree, say what you like. Uh, I think we only have uh, one microphone. So what we'll do is we'll start at the back, please, uh, and then work our way forward. We will get you all in. So at the very back, the guy in the black T-shirt, please, or glasses, yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, thanks. It's just the follow on from that final point, because uh, it's just a thought in the sense that <coughs> I think we would still be having this session, even if Poland and Hungary had bent over uh, and taken the LGBT uh, minority rights, etc. Because there seems to be a historical aspect to this to a degree in terms of it seems that the kind of the Eastern European problem seems to be writ into the EU elite outlook. Um, so kind of at the end of the Second World War, Eastern Europe provides a kind of escape or a, a kind of mechanism to cohere a sense of kind of elite Europeanness. It, it's, it's a threat to, to European values. And so the kind of EU coheres around this notion of Eastern Europeanness uh, as a threat. 
a threat to security. However, with the end of the Cold War, that need of a threat kind of transforms itself. And so the kind of Eastern Europe becomes a new threat. It's no longer a threat to security, but it becomes a threat to uh, cultural values. So I kind of think that there's a historical aspect here in which is kind of writ into the way that kind of Western elites view the East, okay. uh, which kind of, regardless of what Hungary and Poland do, seems to be an inevitable outlook of the kind of Western European supernatural outlook. Right, thank you. We'll just take the microphone forward to that gentleman there, and then afterwards to the lady in front in the, well, Anne Ferreni. Oh, <laughs> just recognize you now. Um, um, <laughs> thanks Sorry, very much to the panel. Lady. Very interesting thoughts as always. <laughs> Um, I suppose I'm picking up from the chair. Um, and, um, the, um, does the Polish election and also the resistance to the attempts to stop the court having arbitrary power in Israel, which the government was doing before the war erupted, um, which seemed to be having m suggest that actually the majority of the public, or at least a very high percentage of it, actually do want rule by judges rather than rule by impersonal law or elected bodies that actually... We, and you know, disproportionately, at least outside Israel, young people support this form of government, that this is the future, um, and it's actually like you know, having kings rule you're used to. Um, it's um, actually increasingly commanding the, a popular majority. Thanks very much. If that can come forward to uh, Anne Faradi there, please. Thanks. It's a question really probably to, to Balash about why you think it is that there is such um, a gap that exists between the perception of what Hungary is like in countries like Britain and what it is actually like in practice. And the reason why I asked this was that I was at a meeting that, in fact, Frank was involved in a debate that was chaired by Jonathan Dimbleby. And um, he, yeah, so this is a, a very, very eminent British broadcaster who spoke about walking, and I quote, literally in fear of his life in Budapest. <laughs> Such, no, this is, I'm not making this up, I promise. <laughs> he was in, uh, walking in fear of his life. Such was the atmosphere of anti-Semitism and anti-gayness. Now, th 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 what's always struck me in my time in Budapest is that regardless of what people say about gay culture, there is a sense of people being out on the streets without being attacked. And in terms of anti-Semitism, I've never been in a place in my life where Jewish culture is quite so celebrated. And I, I, it's interesting that since the recent events, I think people seem to have stopped talking about Hungary as being an anti-Semitic state which is interesting, but th th it, it illustrates my point that there is this trope of what Hungary is, and then there's the actual reality, and I, don't, I genuinely don't understand how that happens. Great, thanks. We're going to keep coming forwards, um, and then we will come back for those that we've missed. So, uh, yeah, that gentleman there with, yes, right where you are, yeah. Hello. Um, I worked and co curates work with Agnieszka when she was at uh, Jostowski. So my two years of um, um, having um, organized and curated some work there uh, is that it is a very, it's an anomaly in many ways, uh, kicking uh, uh, the, the, the kind of, uh, as we discussed, the uh, supranational kind of uh, governance of the EU. Um, and, you know, Poland and Hungary have always been aside in the EU. Um, Poland's getting threats of further fines around the kind of uh, European Green Deal, for example. Um, and um, um, but then, you know, conversely, there's a lot of uh, great, uh, you know, energy there in terms of um, freedom and, uh, uh, and um, uh, a foot, you know, attacks against uh, censorship. But now we've had the Polish elections, which is probably something we're not discussing. Um, and that up to us made a major change um, and also it's a generational shift because I think nearly 69% of uh, the youth, the young votes under 29s came out um, to vote compared to previous elections and more women voted against the PIS um, probably on account of uh, its position on abortion um, and so I'd really like to, you know, that what we're going to probably see is a kind of greater shift back to the EU 
mothership, so to speak. Um, so I'd like to kind of hear comments about why did the PIS um, lose the election? Great, thanks very much. If we can uh, run it forward, actually, we'll take that lady there, please, and then we'll come over to this side here. Oh, hi. Um, so I'm half Polish and have uh, lived in Poland a long time. I was at the Polish Film School, Trish. Um And I see this sort of as a double-edged sword because I certainly see more freedom. I've been to Zamek Ujazdowski. I've seen exhibitions there of a British artist that I think you put on that would never take place here, which is amazing. I've also had work <laughs> rejected from the film, Polish Film Institute for having anti-Polish <laughs> sentiment, which I think you'd be, I mean, I'd be hard pushed to have described it like that myself. And certainly seen very corrupt practices kind of akin to the communist era. So while, and I also see the sort of middle class elites becoming very woke in Warsaw. So while I sort of celebrate the sort of reaction against wokeness, I, I sort of put the question is, to, there is an other authority, I've seen another authoritarianism there, and I was wondering if you could speak about that. Great, thanks very much. Okay, this la lady there, and then we'll come over here, yeah? Uh, isn't this a case of uh, two member states wanting to have it both ways? I mean, you talk about Hungary being a sovereign state. It isn't a sovereign state. It's signed up to the treaty, which you've given your sovereignty away to the European Union. And isn't it really a case of accepting the, the rough with the smooth. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, and then we've got, you both wanted to speak here, the gentleman, then the lady next to him. Um, thank you very much. I will give my name. Uh, I've no problem in my name being quoted. Uh, my name's Ewan Grant. I'm a former law enforcement intelligence analyst who's worked in several EU programs, particularly in Ukraine including just be just after the Orange Revolution and just before and just after the Maidan. I have seen absolutely disgraceful behavior by European Union programs. And let me make it quite clear, um, some very bad behavior by senior Hungarians with horrendous consequences for Ukraine. Let me make that quite clear. Does any members of the press here, I'm quite happy to speak afterwards, though the worst behavior I saw was by a German. Okay, right. We, but we, my we, question... We, I think, sorry, yeah. make it a question, because otherwise yeah. you're not making any specifics here. No, no, no. My, my, my yes, question, question is, uh, do you see any signs within the European institutions, Council of Ministers, Parliament, and particularly Commission, that the boundaries of sovereignty issue needs to be looked at again, particularly because the gentleman's point about migration, this is a totally new crisis, and the European regulations, which I know the Dublin regulation, were just not formulated for that. In other words, change to adapt to circumstances. Okay, thank you very much. Right, I, I will come to the, the have this lady, but pa panel warning, after this lady, you then respond, and then we'll get another round in. Okay, please. My question is, as you can see, I have been colonized by Britain, and there are other colonizers. So is it a kind of colonization of whites on whites? But they can't oh. live without colonization. But okay, so th they've been colonized. Is that the question? Do you feel like that? Do you feel colonized? Is the I guess is the question. Yes. yes. <laughs> right. Okay. So panel, lots to come back on there. Don't try and do it all. But there's some really key questions. So on the hung on the sort of question of Hungary, uh, this question about the gap between perception and reality, I think is mm. is so important. But then there's also this question about uh, trying to have it both ways. You actually signed over your sovereignty when you signed up uh, to the EU treaties. And plenty of questions about Poland, particularly the uh, Polish election result and what that's telling us in terms of young people and the shift in uh, women's vote as well. Okay. Balash. Thank you. Uh, sovereignty, colonization. Let me begin uh, uh, by answering these, these two. 
We haven't given away our sovereignty per se. Uh, we have agreed, like all other member states, agreed to cooperate on certain issues and to, to give away a certain limited amount of their sovereignty on specific areas where it is in the national interest to uh, work together, uh, primarily economic uh, matters uh, and some others. Uh, certainly not um, giving up uh, sovereignty on, uh, on our you know, uh, constitutional identity, on our, on our um, uh, cultural identity preferences. Uh, like others know, th there, is a, there is a battle, it's a political battle, uh, where the Brussels institutions are trying to do that. Uh, and, there is, and, and it has gotten quite, quite bad, actually, and uh, intensified, especially to, to, to an extent of, of, of an ideological colonization attempt. And that is what we are saying no to, and that's uh, the similar thing with, with Poland and some others. Why is the uh, perception so different? Uh, moving on to the question that un unmade. Um, well, it's unusual, I think, that a relatively small country like Hungary is so adamant about its own values and position and, and does it so openly. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it has to do, I think, with, with that. We are, are also a country that, is, that has a unique language, uh, uh, a beautiful language that's a language that's hard to learn. We don't really have uh, linguistic um, cousins around us, so it's a bit more difficult, I think, to get into uh, the way of thinking and, and discourse that is taking place in Hungary for foreigners. Uh, that may have um, uh, uh, may may play a, a part of it, and I think there's also the danger to the to the mainstream. It's a precedent uh, that a, 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 a Central European member state of the European Union is is setting, and they don't like it. And political correctness, to a large extent, is now um, a burden on free speech. It has become a burden on free speech in the West, and these countries are speaking out of that. Uh, we don't accept that burden. You know, we, we, we had it for a long enough time with the Soviets, with the Germans, and I think we, we don't want it anymore. And I refer back to uh, what Agnieszka said um, in the beginning. We, we smell very quickly, you know, the, or we, we feel, we sense the attempts to, to trample down on our, on our independence of decision-making and, and, and thought. And that's uh, what it is, I think. Um, okay, that's great. Thank you. And, and just a oh. uh, last thing about Israel. Or, or, or anti-Semitism, which is just uh, uh, totally absurd. Israel has just decided that it would like to play its football matches in Budapest. Uh, just perhaps that's an informative piece of information. <laughs> well, and, well, yeah, and actually there was also a very uh, important rally uh, after the 7th of October in Budapest, a rally in solidarity. Pro-Israel. Pro-Israel, one of the few actual straightforward pro-Israel yeah. rallies. Yeah. That there I is a Jewish have. renaissance in Hungary, and, and, and we're very proud of it. Yeah. Okay, Anna. Um, I'm just going to reflect on a couple of points. Um, one is the, the first one about uh, the habit of seeing Eastern Europe as a region and as a problem. Possibly, if I understood the questioner correctly, it was relating to the Cold War and, and, and to the, the sort of polarization of the West with, with the Soviet Union. And I think that's a really interesting point, and it's not one I can speak to, but I think it's worth thinking about how foreign policies, how how, how governance structures actually do reflect deep habits of mind. And the, the generation of people who are making decisions, for example, in Brussels, is going to be shaped by understandings of Eastern Europe uh, regionally um, that have been shaped and developed through the Cold War period. And I think the way in which that plays out and has relevance today is that the problem that Eastern European countries have, and perhaps it's a problem that they've always had, is that they have proximity to Russia. And we are now living in a society which is not polarized between the Soviet Union and the free world, so-called. We're living in a paradigm-shifting uh, historical moment where there are multipolar um, vectors in, on the global stage. And the concept of Europe no longer wields the cultural capital that it used to have. The West no longer wields the cultural capital that it used to have. There are powerful nation state actors who sign up to all sorts of things now and nation states are having to work out where their allegiances lie or what serves their best interests. So I think the habits of mind point gives us a way of thinking about how the Cold War has been reconfigured 
now, today, um, between Russia and the so-called European Union. But actually, that's a very, very artificial uh, and, and inaccurate um, view of how the world is, is shaping up I I as we speak. And, and just one more thing about the colonialism uh, question. You know, are we talking about colonialism and does it matter that ostensibly we're talking about a white-on-white -white colonialism, if, if that's not too crude a way of putting it? Um, I think that it doesn't hurt, actually, to ask, as I did in my opening, what is a satellite? What is an imperial possession? Because I'm frankly sick of the fact that all of our virtue signaling positions today are always about things that have passed. So we will talk endlessly, for example, about the displacement of the Native Americans when mass immigration was encouraged to American shores. We will weep over slavery, and we will talk about the British Empire, but nobody seems to want to talk about modern day trafficking. Nobody seems to want to talk about modern day mass immigration. Nobody wants to seem to talk about colonialism in the 21st century. It's simply not possible, because it has to have finished with before we can care about it. And the okay. idea that you can actually <laughs> challenge something using the lessons of history at the time is um, it, it, it's, a, it's a battleground. So okay, I think that's, that's a great a point. Yeah. That's a great point. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> so before I go back out to the audience, uh, Agnieszka, particularly you've got the Polish election to address. There was also a question about corrupt practices raised in your direction, whether you, you, you may or may not have any perspective on that, and then we'll come to Stephen. Okay. Um, so when it comes to election, I, Manik was asking about the women vote and so on. Um, I think when there was this change introduced in 2020, obviously I'm talking from the perspective of an observer and not insider. I think I, like in any party, you have different fractions kind of pushing for the agenda. So it's interesting that the time that they chose to introduce this change um, to remove the possibility of aborting children with possibility of a disability was at, uh, at the time of the pandemic. So in a sense, strategically, that was the worst time to just have any law, any change with anything anywhere. We've seen in the West what happened with the George Floyd uh, uh, murder and the, the subsequent protests around the world, how in general the population was just ready to go to the street and just start fighting with anyone about anything. So definitely there's been an influence on uh, the, the women's vote and in general the younger population. Then um, the other part in the election, what is important to say is that um, the young population is also being influenced by mobile phones and this online culture like in the West. So you see similar patterns with the vote from the bigger cities and, 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 and the younger vote like you see in the West. So it's a similar trend. It seems like we're having this kind of online cloud bubble moving across the globe and sucking young people in. And there is a lot of misinformation and in general manipulation. Um, what is interesting about the result of the election, uh, they still, um, there are still negotiations. It's not very clear um, exactly who will be the prime minister and so on. But what is interesting that if we were just looking at the numbers, the law and justice won because they have the, the bigger number. But then there is this coalition of the parties that they were in the opposition. But it doesn't look like it's going to be a very stable coalition because there is Tusk, who is openly pro-EU, and a lot of Polish people, they openly would say they were against Law and Justice Party because of certain abuses, or they would have their own list of um, grief why they're not happy with the ruling party going into the third term again. But a lot of people will say, but never Tusk, because he's not really for us, he's for the EU. But the Tusk went to Brussels this week, <laughs> he spoke first in English with uh, von der Leyen, and then in Polish he addressed the press, and he said, oh, yes, yes, just to mark it that I'm still uh, representing opposition here, but we have to get this money, and, and I'm just here using this very unorthodox method to get that done. So being an artist, working with artists um, under threat, I always watch what the politicians do, not what they say. So for me, his action is showing that he's not really democratic, his okay. behavior. 
Thanks very much. Steve, and then we're out to the audience. So just actually, I, on, on the, on the is Eastern Europe a threat perceived as a threat to values, I would just highlight that the reason the EU doesn't pick a fight with Germany is because Germany is the main net contributor to EU funding, and it's much easier to bully the people who take your money rather than the people who give you money. Okay, I just, just highlight real politique. On, on the sovereignty question, I think the answer is, is, is yes, but, but both of them are trying to have it both ways. One of the great frustrations, so I have no public position on Brexit. I have never expressed one. I never will. I'm a lawyer. It's not my job to tell you my political opinions. It's my job to help you with the law. Okay, that's it. Straightforward. When I came out, my first ever article, telling off the Germans for doing this to the EU, the, all the leavers hated me. And I got all this abuse online from the, some of the leavers. Then I dare to criticize the same EU, and all the Remainers hate me. And mad, mad pro-EU lawyers were telling me, that the only way I could be politically neutral was if I didn't ever say anything to criticise the EU, which is just insane. I mean, that's just not a sane proposition. And the sovereignty issue has been dodged by the EU itself. Because, yes, I think as law, it's very clear that every member state has given sovereignty to the EU. But when, if, when I said that post, in the post-Brexit years, people would go, oh, you're lying. We, we, don't, we don't give sovereignty away. We, we keep full sovereignty. There are still lawyers on Twitter who will probably lie through their fingers and, and, and tell you that you keep sovereignty as an EU member state, which is just toffee. Now, whether you like it or don't like it, that's your political opinion. There, but but the, the single legal fact that you do give sovereignty is not something I can ever deny. So, I, you know, yes, but it, 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 is, it is more switcheroo than that. And I think it is this... The EU governs by getting you to sign something that's really, really vague and doesn't really make much sense, knowing in full knowledge that its court will tell, interpret that text as whatever the EU wants it to be. And that, that is a simple control trick. The last point is on the Polish election. Yes, and I think you, so you highlighted very well that we are back to platonic thought amongst the elite. We are back to Plato. It's a really bad idea. It tends to cause civilization to collapse, just so you know. But we are back to the idea that there are philosopher princes. Oh, do, do you know who it is? Oh, yeah, it's, it's them. They, they've decided they're philosopher princes. They're so incredibly clever that you're going to be ruled by them. OK, thanks very much, Steve. As well. If we could come to the front this time, we go front to back. Uh, we got the microphones? Oh, you've got it already. Great, perfect. So, yes, I, I was actually going to pick that up about the question, is it all about money? And um, one of the points you mentioned that mess of, with uh, Karlsruhe, so I'm from Germany. P uh, I think it's quite clear that Germany has given up sovereignty. It's actually in its basic law. So, you know, they say, oh, you know, uh, Germany can't pick a fight with the EU because it's against its own basic law. And I found it really interesting, Anna, that you raised history. You mentioned the point of um, Poland having been erased from uh, from the European map for over a hundred years because of imperialist stealing and it used to be a left-wing cause a very old left-wing cause in the 19th century to defend Polish national rights and I just wanted to um, remind you of something closer to our time now which is what do we owe the Poles and the Hungarians in Europe and I would say we owe them everything we owe them reunification German reunification we owe them the fall of the wall so it was Solidarność which started the fight. It was the Hungarians which opened the border. And I find it amazing the EU has completely forgotten that. And it just shows you know, the kind of authoritarian path we're going down. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> if we could pass the microphone here to, to Norman. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think um, your point about the money um, is, is I disagree with. I think, um, I think you really have to ask yourself the question, why is it? that uh, Hungary and, well, and Poland until recently was seen as such a threat to the EU. Because, no, you know, Fidesz, no party in, in Hungary or Poland is calling for Brexit. You're not arguing against the EU. It's not like you're challenging the existence of the EU. But I think what, the, what you have done is you have a national government that has belief in its own values and these are values that are contrary to the elite values of Brussels. And the real point I'm trying to make, ladies and gentlemen, is that the crisis is not Hungary. The crisis is within the EU. It's within the EU elite. It's their need to clamp down on any possibility of other governments and other countries following your example. And what they can see happening across Europe now is the surge 
this, this, this development of populist uh, um, uh, po political parties emerging that are essentially demanding that they have control now over education, all the issues that, are, that, uh, that, that challenge the woke agenda from the EU elite. So it's the weakness of Brussels that is really behind all of this. And that's why, whether it's Hungary or Poland, it'll be anybody else. It's not specifically they're anti-Hungarian. What they're against is that you've had the balls to stand up and say, we don't agree with your values. These are the values that our people believe in, and this is what we're gonna stand by. And for that, you know, we can thank you, because I think that's a be the beginning for me, which I, you know, you don't personally have to agree with me, but I think that's the beginning of, uh, of the, the, the the crumbling of the edifice of the EU. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, please, yeah. Um, right, if you put your hands up really high, I'm gonna try and get in six more people and then uh, we'll come to your concluding comments, okay? So yeah, this gentleman here and then we'll go over to the lady over there with the, uh, blonde hair. Yep, and then after that to that lady there. Thank you. Uh, I work in media and I observe that in English language media in, in America or Britain, there's a lot of very uh, anti-Poland, anti-Hungary, I would say propaganda. I experienced it a bit myself when I do public speaking in, in both Warsaw and Budapest. And uh, one of the things that's repeated all the time, often in headlines at the forefront is that the, the governments of these two countries are vehemently anti-LGBTQ to the point where it's unsafe to be there. Um, but, but an observation that I, I've noticed is that um, as a consequence of um, Poland's and Hungary's really um, hard stance against um, taking in uh, large numbers of Muslim migrants is that you haven't had things like what happened in 2020 in Reading, England, where three gay men were butchered in a park. You didn't have like what happened in Orlando in America, where Nearly 50 people were killed at a gay club by an IS sympathizer. You don't have in your capitals, in your cities, Jewish people being slaughtered like in France. So it, it's just, it's interesting how as a, um, as a result of your <laughs> migration, immigration policies, you are doing a lot to protect certain communities Okay, thanks very much. If we could r rush it over to this la lady here. Uh, so I come from Hungary, and when I was traveling around Western Europe, I often experienced that people believe that we live in an authoritarian political system. So once I was asked the question uh, whether uh, we can speak freely uh, in our country. And I was honestly really shocked because obviously there is free speech because we live in a democracy. Uh, but in, in these Western European countries, there's often a really false image about us. And my question would be whether we can change this image and how we can change it. Great, okay, thank you. And then the, uh, the volunteer lady over there, please. So I think my views are probably quite contradictory to many other people's views. Uh, I also come from Hungary uh, and I'm genuinely worried to, to see that Hungary is, is challenging EU um, regulation in this way. And I'm worried that this will be an excuse for Hungary to, to um, create a referendum about uh, Hungary and whether it wants to leave the EU. Uh, I'm genuinely afraid and whilst maybe the UK benefited in some ways about leaving the EU, I don't see how this would be the case um, for Hungary. Uh, you're probably not aware of the amount of anti-EU propaganda that goes on in Hungary and because of this I'm genuinely worried about how people would vote. And one other point to make is that um, I don't know whether you can say that you know how people feel about immigration in a country where huge amounts of money have been spent on anti-immigration propaganda, on posters on the streets, like hundreds or thousands of them. Uh, so I don't think you know how people really feel and whether you can actually challenge the EU and risk an EU membership if you don't know how your people actually feel. Okay, thank you very much for those comments. 
Um, right, so keep your hands up nice and high. There's a gentleman there in a blue jacket and then a gentleman there with a tie on. And then we'll get to the very back. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, my, my heritage is Polish and uh, I was born and grew up in the UK. Uh, and I'm a gay man. Uh, and in many respects, um, I would actually, uh, I'd seriously consider I actually applied for Polish citizenship. Um, it's still processing, uh, but I, uh, I would feel better off in Poland than I feel often in the UK. I feel increasingly there's a threat. If you just look at what's happened on the streets of London in the last two weeks, we have uh, basically people calling for jihad, for the slaughter of Jewish people. Um, we have uh, the, the, the few people, British people, that were brave enough to go onto the streets last night, about 100 meters, by the way, from where we are sitting now, uh, with the British flag, which should be our unifying flag, were uh, racially abused, called white trash. I mean, this is the country now, the West, and that is a direct result of open door immigration. Um, so that's my strong point. Okay, uh, real quick, because there's a couple, few other people to yeah. get in. Okay, and just on um, the nature of the EU, well, Joseph Goebbels, who was the, obviously the Nazi propaganda minister, uh, said, uh, or was ascribed to him at least, uh, accuse others of what you yourself are guilty of. And I think when it comes to the EU lecturing others on democracy, that is exactly what's happened. Okay, thanks very much. Right. Oh, you know, so we can get everybody in. And we'll keep the applause till the end. Uh, there's a gentleman there with the tie who's had his hand up. And then there's two at the back. And after that, uh, the guy in the grey sweatshirt and the lady over there with the... Gr uh, well, yeah. Please, please keep it nice and short. Same question for Agnesia and Balas. Looking at the recent election in Poland, a lot of the reason why the government lost support is because people who are previously immigrants in say the UK, Germany are coming back now because the economic situation is better in Eastern Europe. How do your parties kind of react to that and adapt their message to maybe suit the more younger liberal audience, which is becoming a bigger voting block in those countries? Great, thanks very much. And then the gentleman with the gray sweatshirt. We're gonna go in reverse. I was uh, particularly impressed that the environment ministers of Poland and Hungary a couple of weeks ago voted against uh, an EU proposition to increase the greenhouse gas uh, emission uh, reductions, if you can increase reductions, and, um, and also the environment minister of Italy where I live. And um, my question to you is, given that the uh, European EU Green Deal has kind of dominated the uh, agenda of this commission. As we go to the 2024 um, European parliamentary elections, do you think there's much appetite in Poland and Hungary uh, to challenge the EU's uh, Green Deal? Okay, thanks very much. So a warning to our speakers, you're gonna get 60 seconds each, so you're gonna have to choose carefully, and we're gonna go in reverse order, starting with Anna. Lady at the back. So while undoubtedly the EU oversteps the mark quite a lot, I don't see how the trans protecting trans rights is overstepping the mark. So in the EU, you have freedom of movement. Um, people are allowed to come and go. And there's been a lot of talk about how movement of people can affect cultures. So surely it's important to ensure in a place where you have freedom of movement that people's rights are protected across that territory. I don't think that teaching about a class of people who undoubtedly exist, who have existed for thousands of years, is like a trans agenda, it's or a woke agenda, I think it's a human rights agenda. And that is something that, that every country agrees to when they sign up as a member of the EU. Okay, thank you very much. Right, okay, Anna, you, you got 60 seconds. Oh, I'm gonna disregard that last comment, but I'm very happy to speak to you afterwards because otherwise I'll go off on one. I would just say, <laughs> I, I would just, I would ju but with respect, I mean, I hear you, but I, I, I think you're wrong. But what I would say by my 60, for my 60 seconds is that what we're seeing play out across the European Union, so-called, is 
um, a sort of broader reenactment of dynamics that are going on within nation states. So, you know, there are now real questions about how um, decisions are being made and what sort of um, um, what, what sort of consensus uh, there really is across the populations of these countries for these policies. Um, and I think we can agree that whether we're looking at an individual country or whether we're looking at the European Union as a whole, the language of equality and freedom and democracy and human rights is being used to push policies that lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people who vote do not agree with, never feel they've been consulted on, don't have mechanisms by which they can challenge, and when they try to use legitimate lawful mechanisms to challenge those policies, they are called populists, they are called anti-democrats, and in the worst case scenario, they're called fascists. Okay. So that is, that is an issue which is being addressed by people across the world, and I'm afraid you know, we've, I, I think the European Union is in crisis because those words have lost their meaning. Okay, thanks very much, Emma. <laughs> okay, thank you. Agnieszka. Um, I will try to be quick and address two things. When it comes to young vo voters, I think it's a question for all of us because wh what we see with the pro Hamas demonstrations in Britain, when you have young uh, Brits going together arm in arm with terrorism, terrorists calling for jihad, that's a problem for all of us, not just for Poland. How to, to talk to the young people, how to educate them, and, and show them what the real life is about. And then the second part, I wanted to talk about art world, and in general, there's one thing that is very subjective, what kind of works are chosen, where, and who's the director or uh, a head in charge, so I would have to talk to you later to learn more about your project, I'm very curious. But in Poland, what I noticed is that we're being colonized, as you said, white by white, because, for example, there was a big research by the British Council into preparing the uh, Poland-Britain 2025 year, and it was done by a private company that was overrun by the far-left um, activists, and they were discussing how to do Poland-Britain without actually basing it on nation. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Agnieszka. Right, Stephen, please. So just two, two points. One on the Polish election. I, in my view, Ursula von der Leyen unlawfully interfered in the Polish election. She very clearly endorsed a candidate. And that, if we start to see more of that, then I think that's going to be very dramatic for the EU. And I think you should pay attention to it. It was probably the most important thing that happened in the Polish uh, e election. The other thing is that somebody said that, that Britain benefited from Brexit. I don't think we did, because to take on the language of, of colonization, we had to give a colony away just to get out. Okay, the Northern Ireland is under EU control. It is not under UK control. Now, it, that was done also in a very dishonest way in order to control the United Kingdom and to make sure that we align with EU law, which is what we've just done. And you will keep, that was the whole binning net zero. It's got nothing to do with net zero. It's got everything to do with aligning with EU law. We will carry on aligning with EU law and following it. So we haven't even really Brexited. Okay, thank you. And finally, Balash. Thank you. Trying to be very quick, uh, a number of points were raised. Green Deal, the environment, the gentleman asked about it at the end. We are committed to our uh, environmental protection, including measures, uh, energy, renewables, etc. but those must be realistically done. So if we opposed a decision, I don't know what exactly it was, then it must have been because of a logic of realism. It cannot destroy European industry, it cannot destroy small companies, etc. It has to be done step by step, and we are committed to, to doing that. Uh, what do we do about younger audience and, and uh, talking to younger voters was a question. Uh, Fidesz, my party, is doing a lot, in fact, to, to, uh, to, do, to doing that. Uh, clubs, uh, um, uh, various uh, networks, organizations, communications. So I'm, I'm glad to say that our support amongst the younger voters is also uh, steady and, uh, and, and, and high, and it's, and it's an important thing to do. So we try to use new technology, et cetera, new uh, ways of communication to involve young people in our political debates and discussions. Um, the lady asked about uh, the danger of Huxit, uh, Hungary leaving the EU. It's not on the agenda at all. We've said uh, on the repeated occasions, uh, the Prime Minister and, and everybody, that it's not something that we'd like to do. We would like the EU to change back to a model that is workable and that we have always uh, uh, supported. So uh, don't be afraid. 
Um, the last point, immigration and, uh, um, and the, the debate about that. I'm proud that Hungary has had uh, a wide-range debate about immigration, about refugees, but a much more lively debate than many other countries. The Hungarian people were asked about these, and they have expressed their opinion on several occasions. We're making a difference between refugees and, and, and immigrants. We have had over 1.5 million Ukrainian refugees who are refugees who have come to our country over the past year and a half. Uh, so that is uh, something that we do. And the last, last point about the, uh, the, the human rights of, of transsexuals, there was, the lady was talking about that. Uh, equality of sexes is a human right. Uh, obviously, the freedom for sexual preferences for adults is a human right, and we respect and, and defend those. Um, propaganda to, to, to children uh, about mutilating their bodies is not a human right, and we got to say no to that, and we continue to say no to that. Thank you. Okay, so thank you to all of you, the audience. Thank you to our speakers. Uh, the next session sessions begin uh, in just over ten minutes at five fifteen.